started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our seminar. My name is Scott Leland. I'm the executive director of the most of our Romani Center for Business and Government at Harvard Kennedy School, which is hosting today's event. Uh, this is actually the last uh, seminar in our Thursday series. Uh, it's hard for us to believe, but the uh, the semester is already over, uh, as we are now in December. We've had a terrific lineup of speakers. Um, if you are interested in reviewing some of the past uh, videos that we've had, they are linked to our homepage. It's mrcbg.org. There's a YouTube link at the bottom of that page, and we'll be putting the link in the chat momentarily. Um, we are recording today's seminar and uh, you'll be able to find that in the YouTube channel as well. Today we have Roland, Ke Roland Ke uh, uh, Cooper speaking on uh, climate change. I encourage you to submit questions. I imagine many of you will have questions. We have two ways of doing that. There's the Q&A uh, function, which is most likely at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So you can write in your questions that way. Uh, you can also raise your hand uh, using that raise hand feature in Zoom. And uh, we uh, will call on you or we may call on you uh, uh, that way as well. So either of those avenues uh, is viable. So um, it is a pleasure to welcome uh, Roland Coopers uh, back to this forum. Uh, he's spoken here before uh, several years ago. Uh, Dr. Roland Coopers is an advisor on complexity, resilience and energy transition, as well as a fellow at the Advanced Institute uh, Advanced Studies, uh, Institute for Advanced Studies in Amsterdam, and he's a professor of practice at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University. He is a theoretical physicist by training, and he spent 11 years, the first 11 years of his career with AT&T in the Netherlands and in Italy. And then he spent another 11 years actually with uh, Royal Dutch Shell in various senior executive functions including Vice President for Sustainable Development. When he last spoke in this forum, it was for his book on complexity and the art of public policy. Uh, today, he's speaking on his new book, A Climate Policy Revolution, which actually with the uh, background is very hard to see, uh, what the science of complexity reveals about saving our planet. So Roland Coopers, it's wonderful to have you back again. Uh, thanks for being with us, uh, and I'll turn the platform over to you now. Great, Scott. Thank you very much. And interesting, you have the art of making the book disappear. That's uh, <laughs> I hadn't seen that before. <laughs> so, um, thank you. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Great that you're joining. What I want to do is is take you briefly, you know, over the next half hour or so through the main arguments of this book, um, and then spend the second part of the of the hour, um, hopefully answering some questions and going into some more examples. Um, so fundamentally, what is this book about? It's about climate, obviously. Um, but what makes it, I think, slightly different than, you know, many of the climate books that are around is that it is focusing on the how to do climate policy and not the what. Because the what actually, unless you've not been paying attention, is actually not so complicated, right? We need to stop burning fossil fuels and you know, eating red meat. And there's a small list of things we have to stop doing. But the, the challenge is, is not figuring out what we need to do, is but how to get those things done. And that's really what this book is reflecting on um, and going through a whole bunch of examples. And it, what it does is it's based on the science of complex systems, of how we know complex systems change, um, and lots of examples. I have many illustrations. I'll go through a few uh, today. Um, it's called revolution. It's about revolution policy because it's about nonlinear change, right? Is how do we get a revolution, a nonlinear change on purpose? So that's the fundamental uh, idea behind the book. Now, I won't say too much about climate change because I'm assuming that if you've dialed in, you, you, know, you know all the basics. So I won't tell you, you know, how urgent it is, et cetera, because that's been said elsewhere and better than I can. Uh, but but the, 
just to think about the situation is essentially we've sat on our hands, right? We've procrastinated about climate change. We've known about the urgency of this issue for decades, if not a century, if you go back in literature. Um, there's a wonderful speech, which I can highly recommend, uh, slightly unlikely, but very moving, uh, by Margaret Thatcher in front of the UN General Assembly in 1989, you know, passionately warning that we need to do something about climate change. And uh, of course, we didn't. Or we didn't, you know, we, we did a few things, but they're not relevant at the scale we need to do it. So as a result, um, and I think this is the core point for this book, gradual change is no longer an adequate solution. There is no gradual pathway that will get us to one and a half degrees. Um, and so we need to think about how nonlinear change happens. Now, fortunately, that's possible, uh, but it's not that easy. Now, you see lots of demonstrations um, where people have signs that say, you know, we don't want climate change, but we want system change. Uh, which is a nice slogan, uh, but the question is, what does that really mean? What does system change look like and what are the tools and what are the practical approaches to make that happen? Um, so that's what the, uh, what the argument I tried to explore in this book. So the first thing uh, to, to reflect on for a second is how do things change in the first place, right? <laughs> is how, how does change actually happen? Um, and, you know, here are lots of images of nature, of how things grow, and, and a lot of the, the laws are, are, are inside, the, the, you know, the, the, our, our way, our studying of the world, both the natural world and the social world. Um, but I think it's useful to distinguish between three different ways of change uh, when you think about policy. One is top-down change. Um, the other is change through market forces. And the third bucket that I would offer is uh, this idea of systemic change. Um, and, you know, top-down changes are fine, um, but as I said before, we're actually not doing them. And there's actually a reason which I go into the, in the introduction of the book, is that democracies by and large are set up to avoid uh, making systemic change, you know, they, they, and, and that's by choice. Authoritarian regimes, on the other hand, could make systemic change, but generally, uh, with possible exception of China, they're not really interested in climate policy. Um, <clears throat> so you have these three buckets. So let me just give you three examples of what that looks like. So top-down change would be close the coal plants, right, which is, you know, kind of the no-brainer for climate policy. But the reality is that there are 6,000 coal plants on the planet and there's a thousand, what's more serious is there are a thousand more that are planned and financed and under construction. Um, so yeah, top-down change, it sounds like a good idea, but it's just not happening. So I'm not opposed to it, it's just not happening. The other bucket is market forces, right? Uh, and the prime example of that is CO2 pricing um, and you know there are others. Um, and also there, we have to say that it's either not happening or it doesn't work. So the, 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 the prices are set for change at the margin, um, which for economists makes sense. But if you're trying to change a system, that doesn't make sense. Uh, so market forces are, are all great and good, but at this point, um, they have limited use. And so that brings us to this third bucket, which is uh, the category of systemic change. And that's what I want to talk about. So what do we know about systemic change? And this uh, just the world's briefest introduction to complex systems. And some of you may have come across it. And I apologize for the repetition, but some of you may not. Um, so complexity science, and, and that's a real thing, is now about 30 years old. So three decades old science, not new, but also not terribly old. Um, but there's a great precursor. Uh, for example, Hayek wrote in 1964 uh, quite eloquently on the theory of complex phenomena and, eco and economics. And there's a wonderful uh, classic essay from 1972 uh, by Anderson called More is Different. And there, so there are early signals um, of complexity science, but it is now a full and mature part of science. And the interesting thing is it's across every single discipline. There isn't a single faculty in the world at 
top universities that does not have a complexity program. And the institute that I'm associated with in Amsterdam, for example, is it called the Institute for Advanced Study, but actually it's the Complexity Institute um, uh, in hiding. Um, and what complex systems, what the study of complex systems is about is how do, how do things, how do ch systems change from within, from their own internal dynamics? Now the, the cliche of complex systems is bird flocks, and but things are are um, are a cliche for a reason. And you know, so the question is, how do bird flocks organize themselves? Now we know two things about bird flocks, right? First of all, we know that there is no choreographer, so there's no big boss telling the birds where to go or how to fly. And the second thing is, we know that the agents in this system are literally bird brains, so they're not too smart. And yet collectively they managed to do these amazing things. And so complex complexity science is about understanding, and this is now quite well understood, is what the simple rules, is what the simple mechanisms are that lead to this, to this behavior. Um, this picture actually is not a bird flock, it's a flock of drones that are programmed with the same rules that the birds use, and they're flocking above Burning Man. Um, in uh, in the US. Um, so the, the system, the, the rules work and you can apply them to drones as well as to uh, as to birds. Just one word about the, the one one image about the word complex, which is a pretty bad branding for a for a science, uh, because it means something to people, right? You may have a complex relationship with your brother in law or you know you you may find COVID policy complex. Um, that, that is a different meaning of the word. Um, complex comes from the Latin plexus, which is to braid, as these wonderful Nigerian women have done. Um, and so complex means systems, means, uh, systems with braids. So it's the science of braided or interconnected systems. So just think about complexity as a different word than the standard meaning that you may associate with it. And just think about these wonderful women. Um, and so uh, before I go in, in the, in, into a number of examples, to just recap um, these three different frames for looking at policy, right? You have the control frame, the, you know, the economics of control frame, top-down change, through which you can look at issues such as climate change as we do today, but it equally applies to security uh, pandemics, uh, rather importantly as well, uh, transportation, financial regulations, et cetera. Um, you can look at a problem through a kind of a market, a, you know, referred to as a, in my previous book as a market fundamentalist frame, as you know, people who believe that the market is always the answer. Um, and there's a third frame, which I will illustrate with some examples of looking at these problems through a complexity frame. And the question always is, what's the right frame for a particular problem at this particular time? I, I'm not arguing, and I've noticed I have to say this twice because people naturally assume that I'm advocating something better than what other people are doing, and I'm not, is that this complexity frame is just an expansion of the tool set. It, it isn't always the best solution. But for this problem of climate change, I would go further than I think it is actually the, the, the thing to look at today because we've demonstrated that we have been incapable of taking top-down change measures um, or, or, market, uh, or using market mechanisms effectively uh, because we're simply not making the progress that we should. Um, so so that's, that's really the, uh, um, the question. And, and it is because because um, these climate problems are so devilishly interconnected, right? You know, greening the power system is an obvious requirement. Uh, but why can't we do that is because the, the, the electricity system is deeply interconnected with everything in society. The returns from fossil fuels uh, underpin our pension system uh, and so on and so on and so on. And so you can't change these things in isolation. You really have to look at their interconnected nature.
So enough abstraction. Let me give you let let me go through three or four examples that that illustrate this. The, the book actually is full of a whole series of examples, but I, I won't uh, list too many, or else it'll get tedious at this point. But let me give you three illustrating illustrate illustrations. So the first is uh, solar policy. So if we look at German solar policy, has become famous uh, because of its uh, innovation about 15 years ago to introduce an interconnection, a, a feed-in tariff. So you were guaranteed a relatively high price to, to deliver back power from your solar panels to the grid. And that price was high enough, not market-based, but high enough to be able to, uh, to afford the expensive solar panels at the time. And that feed-in tariff has gone down over the years as panels have become cheaper. Um, that's been a wildly successful policy from all sorts of perspective. It's the biggest development project ever. The German taxpayer has funded the cost reduction of solar panels for the world at the tune of about 100 billion euros. Um, but let's, let's look at this policy through these three different frames. So through the first frame, the control frame, you could say, you, could, you might pick up one newspaper that says, hey, look, this is you know, the power of the state at its best, right? It's the Prussian state that has had a big idea and intervened and has made change at an enormous scale and it's, you know, top-down policy at its best. And you might pick up another newspaper and say, no, no, you don't understand this at all. This has actually been uh, just getting the incentive right so that the market and innovation and industry stepped up and they made this happen and, and delivered this enormous change you know, two stories that are probably relatively familiar. The question is, what does this phenomenon look like through a complexity lens, through a systems lens? And there you would say um, that one of the great successes of German solar policy is it's been a social norm policy. Um, there is no country where support for climate policy is as deep across gender, across age, across political affiliation as in Germany. And I've experienced actually here in my house in Amsterdam, which is in a World Heritage site, I've illegally put solar panels on my roof, which is completely forbidden. <clears throat> and what happens is that people ask you questions and they say, who are you? You know, why did you do this? Um, are you now a vegetarian? Why do you still drive a Porsche? And um, it's engendered a whole series of conversations. And with a level of penetration in Germany, you've seen knock-on effects into all sorts of other sectors. And one of the um, one of the things that will be familiar to everybody today is that the, the propagation of solar panels in a neighborhood fits the exact same models as epidemics. So solar panels are contagious and they're contagious with the same algorithm as COVID-19, just a different, different <laughs> contagion rate and certainly a different outcome. Um, and I don't want to be flippant about this, but the, the system understanding is actually very similar. Um, and and so, so they spread across neighborhoods depending on the, on the, um, on the kind of city they're in. So, so that's, uh, and so these three stories of the solar panels are all true. Um, but the question is, and I have a secret ambition to ask Angela Merkel one day uh, when she's retired, if she ever retires, is whether, um, this idea of social norms policy was actually part of the decision at the time, but it's certainly been part of the way it played out. So let me go on to a second example, um, which is inequality. Now, you know, Obama, when he left office fairly late, I have to say, said that inequality would be one of the defining issues of our time. And I think he's right, but it's also not very new. Here, you know, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote about inequality. And of course, Piketty has written two uh, actually rather wonderful doorstoppers on, on the subject. Um, at, but from a systems perspective, inequality is a huge factor in climate policy. Um, and yet, you know, you, you find it, you don't find it at the COPs, you don't find it in the IPCC. Um, uh, one example is the French Gilets Jaunes protests that happened over the past years where the government wanted to increase for legitimate climate reasons um, the tax on uh, diesel fuels um, and that ran into, um, it's a long story, but the way the French social contract was structured with 
you know, people with lower incomes living on the outskirts and being able to commute into cities. Um, and the increased inequality basically ground that, uh, uh, that particular climate policy to a halt. Uh, but the issue is deeper than that, right? If you look at who actually is emitting, is responsible for the emission of greenhouse gases, it's the top few percent in the world, not just in the West, actually is also true in India and China and Malaysia and Pakistan and everywhere else. But it's largely the rich who are causing climate change. And therefore, the distribution of income and of wealth um, it should be an integral part of climate policy. And again, not of, out of ideology, um, even though I may have views on that, and certainly Rousseau did. Uh, but the point is, you won't, you won't be able to progress uh, because the path dependency, so the, the, you know, the, the, the momentum of you will not be able to get the system into the motion you want without addressing this issue, without understanding the connection between climate policy and inequality. Um, let me give you a third, another example before I run out of time here. <coughs> um, Red meat, um, as many of you will know, um, a, the, the second no-brainer, if you had full freedom, uh, uh, in addition to closing coal plants, would be to stop eating red meat. Red meat is, and this is true for red meat, less so for, for uh, poultry, uh, but red meat uh, is incredibly energy intensive and the energy that's associated with it has an enormous uh, carbon footprint. And if you were to uh, eat this, get the same amount of nutrition through plants, um, it, 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 gives, it has orders of magnitude less, um, uh, less greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and in the bigger scheme of things, you know, it would seem that it's a thing that's relatively easy to give up. Um, and yet, of course, it isn't. Um, and this is perfectly resistant to top-down policy, right? There is, it's unimaginable that any government would somehow forbid people to eat red meat. Uh, you would have an <laughs> uprising on your, hand, uh, on your hands. Um, and equally, you know, using market mechanism, taxing, et cetera, will be extraordinarily difficult to, uh, to realize. Um, now, if you look at it through a systems lens, Social norms and habits are contagious. Solar panels are contagious, but most of our habits are contagious in the same way, again, as, as bad things are contagious. Good things are contagious also, fortunately. Um, now, interestingly enough, we, have, we don't really even know in the scientific literature is how you catch uh, vegetarianism. Do you become a vegetarian because your kids or a flexitarian or whatever, because your kids say you should stop eating meat? Is it because it's your friends or you see something on television? So if we, if we understood better what the propagation, the social propagation mechanisms are of not eating red meat, uh, we could find ways to, to stimulate that. And this isn't advertising, right? It's about changing the network structure um, of, of the connection uh, so that more and more people uh, stop eating red meat. Now, the wonderful thing about these kinds of policies is that, you know, you like your own tastes. Everybody hates it when somebody else tells you you need to change your taste. But if you change your tastes um, organically through your context, you're perfectly happy with them. Um, and so, so that's uh, uh, so, so that's another uh, a, a different and powerful way, I believe, to look at uh, such an issue. Um, the other big bucket, and I've tried to go through several buckets of this, social norms, uh, dealing with path dependencies. Um, another one is uh, uh, there are particular infrastructures that are necessary to facilitate change. Now, one of these infrastructures, and it's slightly wonkish, but I won't go too much into the technical detail, is that if you transport electricity over a long distance, you lose a lot of it. Um, now, there's one way of fixing that is by building direct current as opposed to altern alternative cur alternate current networks. And um, if you model this a little bit, you see that effectively you can, if you can create a, almost like a copper plate over a continent where renewable, you know, the infamous 
interruptibility of renewables can be fixed because you can move power around from the wind and solar into different places. Um, and so this is, uh, and, and there are plenty of examples like this, this is kind of an enabling infrastructure that's required in order for a change to happen. Um, and this is quite an interesting case also. Uh, China has so far built 30,000 kilometers, last time I looked, 30,000 kilometers of um, high voltage DC backbone. The US virtually nothing. The first proposal is just, is just being discussed. And Europe in its European way is sort of cobbling it together between different countries and, and will possibly get there at some point. Uh, but the idea that, that certain things are, are a precondition in order for system change to happen, I think is an important consideration. In a sense, fix, dealing with, inf with um, inequality is also an infrastructural thing, right? It's a precursor to be able to have a system um, make the, the, uh, the required changes. Um, so in summary, what I'm trying to argue in, the, in this book is that, you know, time's up, right? So we, we no longer have time for gradual change. So we have to understand these kind of snowball measures that have the potential to change non-linearly. And, and it's through system science that can give us hints where these things happen. Um, but bottom-up change has a bad name, right? It just assumes that let a thousand flowers bloom, and, and that's not what I mean. It's understanding how, how bottom-up change actually can scale. This isn't necessarily new, right? I, I would hope that some of you recognize that, that, you know, if you take something like the GI Bill after the Second World War that catalyzed a lot of the suburban development in the U.S., it is a similar kind of catalytic policy that's had massive changes through a relatively small intervention. Um, so, so this, it's not that nobody's ever thought of this before, but it, as, as, a, as a focal area for really designing climate policy around, uh, it, is, it is currently insufficiently used. Um, and so, uh, you know, as a last thought I want to leave you with is, um, if you're framing policy through a complexity lens, you would look slightly differently. You look th literally through a different lens or through a different frame, and you're, you're interested in, the collect in changing the collective phenomenon and not the individual agents. So you're trying to get the bird flock to flock differently. You actually don't really care about the individual birds, <laughs> but you care about what they do collectively. And um, as Anderson in this, 72 paper said more is different in complex systems the sum is not the whole is not the sum of the parts so you need to really understand how the whole is shaped and and happens and what we're interested in climate policy is is uh, the systemic uh, emissions and whether one person emits more or less really doesn't matter that much um, the second thing is you would really be obsessive about interconnected systems. Um, you know, these, you know, people, are, you know, for example, the argument around, you know, people who are pushing green hydrogen, um, uh, you know, fail to see that if you, if you put a lot of renewable power into hydrogen, you actually take it away from fossil fuel replacement and you're, you're just uh, moving stuff around. And so really looking at this, the impact of a full system when you're, when you're uh, arguing for a new policy, I think is critical. And the third thing that you see in, in this systems perspective is you're going to get everything wrong or at least slightly wrong. And, and you have to assume that you're gonna to have to course correct because these complex systems are not um, easy to model. And, and this is certainly true for societal system. So there is no perfect answer. You need to, have to be prepared to keep, um, to keep fine tuning these things. Um, so I wanted to leave it there and stop talking at this point. And, um, you know, I've got plenty of more examples, but perhaps <laughs> we can get to those through some questions or through some criticism from the participants. Thank you very much, Roland. That was a, a fascinating tour through systemic change and what it is and why it's important. Um, I want to, uh, I have a question or two, but I also want to um, 
make sure that people know to submit their questions via the Q&A or to raise your hand. Um, first, just, uh, just a comment, uh, Roland, you, you were talking about contagion and uh, the changing, changing norms and social values and uh, bringing up the example of red meat. And uh, there's an interesting development in Singapore over the past week, which is that it is now the first country to approve lab-grown cultured chicken. And presumably uh, lab-grown beef, red meat, uh, is not gonna be far behind. And uh, it strikes me that um, this, of course, is, is hugely important for climate change, as you, as you point out. Um, and, but the development of this, uh, I don't know if, if how it looks through a, a, a systemic change lens. Um, it's not, certainly not a top-down change. You could argue that it's a market forces driven change, but you could also say that it's a technology change. And um, I guess that's, uh, that's my question is, uh, how does this look from a systemic point of view? Um, and is this something that um, government should be pushing hard from a policy point of view, or if it's actually kind of bubbling up somewhat organically through technological development, through uh, market opportunities, should governments just sort of sit back and applaud and, and let that happen? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, it's unlikely to scale at the speed that's required, right? And, um, and so there are plenty of examples of these solutions that seem like a good idea and they are a reasonable idea, uh, but will they make change at the scale that's that's required? You know, this meat is a lot more expensive than, uh, you know, quite a lot, <laughs> by a lot. And, you know, it could be cost reduced over time, etc. But hope is not a strategy um, when there is a perfectly reasonable alternative, which is just consuming a hell of a lot less red meat, right? And And, you know, those who are vegetarians around this call will know that, you know, you don't regret eating less red meat when you stop doing it. So it's not that your utility function goes down in any way. <laughs> There's no price to pay for these kind of, um, of, of changes of norms. So, you know, I think it's fine. I'm not, I'm not against it in principle at all, um, but I just, I'm skeptical that it, would that it would be a solution at the scale required within the time frame required. Right, if we add a hundred years and then, yeah, then maybe it's a good idea if we were back in the 60s. But today we're looking at change over a decade and, and it's hard to see how that would happen non-linearly, this kind of a switch substitution. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, State Senator uh, Mike Barrett is uh, raising his hand. So uh, I'm going to activate him in the, in the session. So, uh, Senator Barrett, please ask your question. I think you're muted. Let's see. Uh, well, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Fascinating discussion. I want to thank our presenter and I want to thank the Kennedy School. Uh, it seems as if um, our, uh, our presenter, Dr. Coopers, is still arguing that uh, humans, for the most part, uh, have to catalyze this change. Uh, the point he just made is that <clears throat> organic changes left to their own devices will not happen quickly enough. They have to be harnessed in some way, perhaps guided or channeled in some fashion. Uh, in the end, uh, for a lot of democracies, this boils down to strategic steps that, well, for, that political leaders should take if only to reinforce the norms that are emerging or if only to incentivize the emergence of such norms. So who's thinking about exactly what levers humans can work in order to encourage these uh, systemic changes in a particularly useful direction? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I, I think, you know, these, this categorization is really important, right? Is it goes back to the discussion of how does change happen, right? You can encourage them by telling people they need to change, or you can incentivize 
you know, which suggests some markets incentives, et cetera, or other incentives, or you can tweak the system. And this is where you get to examples like the GI Bill, um, which changed the layout of American cities in a major way over, dec over a fairly short period. Um, another example is the, um, the incredibly rigorous mercury emissions regulation that the US uh, Congress adopted, um, which de facto led to the demise of a lot of the coal plants in the US, which was not a climate policy, but it was a catalytic policy that had a non-linear change. So what, what I offer in this book is, is to make, is to really think about that as a third category, right? Is one is policymakers, you know, tell, you know, quote unquote, right? Somehow tell people what change they want. The other is they set up incentives. And the third category is they change the architecture of the system with, you know, based on an understanding of how systems work so that they change from within. And, and I really think of that as a third category of, of, of policy instruments. That, that's not enough part of the standard policy narrative at this point, in, in my humble opinion. If I might just make, if I might just make one follow-up comment. Uh, uh, first of all, I agree with you. And uh, I find uh, what you have to say in this respect very in interesting. On the other hand, uh, it does argue really for a, an additional layer of sophistication in, well, I hesitate to call it top-down policymaking, but certainly an additional layer of sophistication in policymaking. I think, for example, about current COVID policy in the US. There's no question that we need norms to change and that compliance somehow has to become organic if we're to get out of the dilemma that we're in. But on the other hand, the default tends to be to lionize wonderful people like Dr. Fauci in the hopes that he will uh, jumpstart this organic process of compliance that, that you're pointing to. So there's kind of a, a confusion or a contradiction at work here, isn't there? Yeah. You know, a lot of our, but this is why we have a wonderful Kennedy School, etc. But a lot of our policy narratives are hopelessly confused, right? Um, you see it in Europe, which is, a, you know, in, in France, um, if you go out, you have to have, a, I, I went to high school in France, so this is very familiar to me, you, you have to have a little note that you sign that justifies why you're going to the supermarket. And in the Netherlands, where I am, you know, people retain full agency. You can go out and do whatever you want and there's, the people are counting on more voluntary participation. So this, this whole COVID situation indeed is a, is a massive experiment in, in these three buckets of policy. And, and, uh, but it, you, you're, you're right, to, to have systemic change or this kind of complexity policy mm -hmm. requires a more sophisticated mm -hmm. uh, political apparatus and political narratives but I'm afraid in the case of climate, we don't have a lot of choice, right? Because the standard approaches don't seem to be working. Okay, let's go. We've got quite a few questions lined up in the Q&A. Um, uh, one of our attendees asked, what would be some examples of policy measures to reduce emissions in China and India using this framework? So... China and India, particularly China, is doing remarkably well. And you know, it's the one example I would, I would put in terms of, of, uh, of top-down climate policy that may actually work. So we'll see. Um, but uh, you know, one of the major issues in China, and, and which also extends to Korea and Japan, is the financing of this 1,000 new coal plants. So the expansion of the coal fleet is financed by a relatively small number of financial institutions. So finding a theory of change, a, an intervention with that network of people, it's perhaps 100 people who are financing that, um, I think would be a powerful, uh, powerful intervention. Um, 
so so that would be uh, would I, I think would make an enormous difference it's not just china but it's the whole belt and road initiative which rolls out across asia pakistan malaysia etc all the way into italy um so that's one way um i and so, so the the other is uh, is also I think more attention to this issue of inequality, right? Because uh, there's no doubt that most of the greenhouse gas emissions in China and India are, are, are either by the elites or to serve Western consumption, right? So one of the things you might think about is, I, I know this is in the US has never made it onto the radar, but if you look at the structure of a value added tax, where you tax at the place where value is allowed added along the chain, you could think of a carbon added tax so that you know, the, the carbon that's added ultimately is charged to the end consumer um, because currently Western consumers take no responsibility for the uh, carbon emissions that we have outsourced to China and India. So again, it's about the interconnection, you know, which bit of our emissions in those countries are actually caused by us if I look at the framing of your question. Um, no no one-liner answer, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you. Another question. Um, I'd be interested in the view on accelerators, such as coupled systems, uh, electronic uh, electric vehicles as storage for the grid, for example. If uh, electric vehicles become ubiquitous, the variability issue could be managed without utility scale of battery storage. Do you have any comments on that? Yes, so I wrote a whole chapter on electric vehicles um, in the book, and I don't, it's, it's a bit of a long story, but let me just give you the, the, the really short uh, version of it. I think electric vehicles are fascinating, not for transportation and not for the storage issue, but as a social norms policy, if we were to move, it's the largest consumer purchase that any person makes. And if we were to move away to autonomous self-driving electric vehicles, which is you know, a plausible future, that has the potential to change an enormous amount of things in terms of our social norms, in terms of the amount of accidents that happen, in terms of our medical system, in terms of urban space. In US cities, 30 to 40% of the urban space would be released from parkings for redeveloping cities, et cetera. So I think, through a systems lens, it's not so much, you know, by sticking too much to this battery stuff, et cetera, which I'm not trivializing is really important. But if you think about the systemic change potential of electric vehicles, it's in the autonomous collectively owned vehicles and it's not in the incremental, you know, I have a Tesla, which is, you know, basically a really heavy, you know, nice improvement over the previous car but it's not a system change. And there is potential for system change there, um, but for systems outside the transportation system, and it's this interconnection between systems, I think that makes it fascinating. Thank you. To another question, to what extent is structural change in our governance systems required for this? Complexity policy lies in opposition to the quick and easy fix strongman politics that is currently visible across a lot of the world. How can complexity policy be integrated given our current four to five year election cycles? Yeah, and the first thing I would say is, you know, there aren't that many strong men. The other thing is that strong men actually understand this stuff pretty well. They just don't use it for the kind of stuff we're talking about here, but they're quite astute in terms of figuring out what small changes would lead to, what small interventions lead to big changes. Um, so, you know, the answer I think is quite mixed. The, the, the point is you have to want to deal with climate in the first place, right? Or else we're not gonna get there. But I think our current governance systems are perfectly capable of dealing with this. We don't, we don't need to change our government systems, governance systems. We just need to add this toolkit, this set of policy options um, more explicitly to the, to, the, to the options we have. If you look at the lists, you know, the long books and reports that say what we should do, very little of it is about this kind of complex complexity policy. Thank you. Uh, so Professor Bill Clark, who leads a, a program at the Kennedy School on Sustainability Science, uh, has a comment and a question. Uh, 
Uh, Bill Clark, I'm going to read your comment in the uh, as you've submitted in the Q&A, uh, and then if you wish to elaborate, um, I'm going to elevate you to speak on it as well. Um, but let me read you the, the comment in the question. This is from Bill Clark. He says, I've been following a lot of the work on implications for climate policy of viewing iterations between environment and society as complex adaptive systems, much of it from schools in the Netherlands. Dominant themes from the work, from, from that work, are the importance of cultivating, one, micro-level niches for innovation, for example, solar panels, two, macro level for biasing selection from among those innovations, those that will support the transitions you want to achieve, for example, feed-in tariffs, and crucially, meso level political action to destabilize or undermine the power of incumbent interests who don't want such innovations or transitions to occur. Uh, and uh, Bill Clark says that he's uh, put in the chat one paper summarizing uh, this stuff, which we'll try to send out. Uh, could you comment on the similarities and differences between the view from the complexity lens that he's just summarized and your own? Uh, and Bill, you are live in case you want to add any additional uh, clarification or comment. Uh, no additional comments. Uh, you read it perfectly. <laughs> Thank you so much. You read it better than I wrote it. <laughs> um, you may be referring to Jan Rotmans, by any chance? Rotmans and Giels and yeah, Urbach yeah, yeah. at Maastricht yeah. and so on. Yeah, I think, so, I think what they do is absolutely useful, uh, but that, you know, there is an, a regrettable tendency also amongst complexity folks to reductionism, <laughs> to too quickly try to get to, to schemes and formulas, etc. And, and I think that suffers a little bit from that. Um, you know, my view and, and the kind of policy interventions that, that I've made or have been involved in is, is really to, to, to have a more open discussion and get experts to co-think, to guide experts in, in the kind of interventions rather than identify them. Um, so I think though the, the, the kind of frameworks that they propose are useful, but I think they're slightly too narrow and we need to go back to basics. Um, and, and look more broadly at it because, you know, climate policy is fiendishly uh, complex, literally, and, and touches every single aspect of society. And, and uh, because of the interconnection between these things is as soon as we reduce it down to, oh, there's this trick to get the, to get the, the power system to become green, I think we're, we're, we're too optimistic. I think these things have deeper path dependencies and more resistance to change than we anticipate. Uh, one, as a last comment, one particular category of policies that's unusual and, and not often said is sometimes you have to purposefully break a path dependency. So it's a destructive policy to cut a path dependency to liberate a system to be able to change. And I think there are, I, I think there are the, the frameworks that have been formulated in the Netherlands, indeed, in particular, are useful, but but not yet. Uh, we're nowhere near um, what we need, and, and and I don't want to say that I have all the answers, right? I just think, you know, more people should think in this direction, and they certain and those people you quoted certainly help, and probably you as well. I'm sorry if I don't know your work. Thank you. A question from RB who asks, uh, with regard to the integration of solar and wind and adoption of electric vehicles, it seems that the field of dreams approach, build it and they will come, works best. If people see them, they will buy and use them. Is that correct? And is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, no. <laughs> this is the short, is the short answer. Um, I think what you're describing is largely the market approach, right? The market fundamentalist approach. As long as you know people innovate and and it, it will it will all happen. So let me give you one specific example. So we're you know we're kind of lucky that Tesla came along and made electric vehicles possible, uh, but from there to autonomous vehicles. Uh, you know, the kind of vehicles that actually would make a difference to the climate, uh, 
there are a number of enormous thresholds to be taken, uh, to be taken out. Uh, for example, you know, autonomous vehicles, which will be lightweight, do not mix well with uh, human-driven SUVs. And so you have to think about, you know, separating roads, etc. And so there are all sorts of infrastructure things that, that are required. Um, and what underlies your, your it, and I don't mean this as an accusation at all, but the, one of the assumptions I think that underlies your question is the idea that there's a level playing field and that, you know, therefore every, every new technology has the same chance. And if you look at things through a complex system lens, the whole idea of level playing field is a nonsense. It's, it's something that doesn't exist. Um, things have path dependencies and, and, uh, and you have to look at, a, at it much more deeply than through this, you know, traditional, I think, relatively uh, oversimplified economics lens. Thank you. Uh, Manfredi Caltigeron asks two questions. One, how do you map the systems to be changed? And who is the system operator that can bring about the change? Uh, isn't the say, isn't not saying what your policy objective is patronizing towards the public, or should we just consider it a necessary evil? Yeah. So thank you, Manfredi. Um, so um, the system. I think for this purpose, we have to consider the people in governance are the system operators, right? The 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 the, the people in government. Um, and public government really operate our societal systems. It's not perfect, but they're the ones that are empowered with degree, different degrees of legitimacy to make these interventions. So I think it's them. Your, your second point, I think, is, is, is really interesting, and it's one I struggled with in the book, uh, particularly in the last chapter. There's an ethical problem with complexity policy, right? Because in the, as you point out very correctly, you're not really leveling with people. There's something sneaky about doing this. Um, and so there is a real legitimacy issue with that. And, and that's a dilemma, which I frankly don't quite know how to deal with. But again, it's happened before, right? Is if you go back to the GI Bill that I quoted a number of times, did somebody stand up when the GI Bill was adopted and said, beware, this might completely change the fabric of our cities and might completely change the racial structure of the country, et cetera. And so um, it, it's not unusual, but, but you point to a really important dilemma and the, the, the democratic or the, um, the, the ethics around this complexity policy are, are, are a real issue that, that, that deserves attention and, and deserves deeper thinking than I've been able to devote to it. So thanks, yes. Thank you. Uh, Diogo Osorio asks, he says, hello, Roland. Thanks for this presentation at my old school. I assume you may know him. As we are talking about policy change in a scale rarely seen before, how do you connect the framework given by complexity and the cognitive dis dissonance so characteristic of climate change, the frog in the boiling water? How can we get complexity to be, tr to be translated in a way that gives the kick without scaring to death those who need to change. Yeah, so thank you, Diego. I think there, um, you know, was my last point is that what we need to change is the collective, so the emergent nature of a system. So we need the birds to flock differently. We actually don't need to get every single bird engaged or even convinced. And so the individual agents don't matter that much right? It's about changing their collective behavior. So think also about, um, you know, the problem, the issue, the upcoming issue with, with vaccine resistance with COVID. We're, we're really not interested in convincing everybody they should take a COVID vaccine, but we need enough to create herd immunity. And so I think you, because that's the collective aspect that we're looking at, we're looking for herd immunity from COVID through vaccination. And I think for these climate policy, there's something similar is that you want to have measures that change enough that the collective, um, that, that collectively it, it changes. Whether there are a couple of people who, who eat a pound of red meat every day, I don't really care <laughs> as long as, uh, as the collective impact is reduced. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Bodan Oryeshkovich uh, and Dr. Yeshkovich, I uh, 
unmuted you, so please go ahead and ask your question. Yes, uh, could we give a solar panel pad to, first of all, thank you for, for this is the first time I've ever been asked a question on uh, Zoom, or been it, it, so I'm a little excited. Could we give a solar panel pad to every child to train them to collect and value energy from an early age so that they can learn to power their devices? I have such a plan uh, for Ukraine uh, which is very dependent on Russian oil. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question and congratulations on graduating to Zoom questioning. But it, so yeah, no, it's a good question. So what what I would suggest from a system, so you know that can be useful from an educational perspective. From a systems perspective, if you think about this aspect of the contagion, quote unquote, of solar panels, what you'd actually look at is in cities, maybe through satellite pictures you know, what the solar panel deserts are, and you would look for influencers, literally, you know, who are people in that community that people would look for as an example, and you would give them free solar panels so that other people copy them. So we're, we're, we're at, for, for this particular, you know, a, a adoption of solar panels, we wouldn't even be that interested in, in the children. We're interested in the nodes in the community that might lead to rapid propagation literally within the next year, or else we'll just have to wait for those kids to grow up. So you, you, what you're proposing, I think it's sensible, but from a theory, from a rapid change of society and greening of power, I think there are more, you know, there's a more focused uh, approach that leverages our understanding of networks and complex systems. Thank you. Um, we're coming close to the end of our time, so uh, we have a last question. Uh, President Joe Biden has promised on day one to rejoin the Paris Agreement, to make large investments in a green economy, and to incorporate climate policy not just within the Environmental Protection Agency, but throughout the various departments and agencies of his administration. Is this an example of a potential climate revolution? Is this how government creates new social norms? More generally, what advice would you give to the new administration? So um, I think this is an example of playing catch up. And, and I'm really happy that the US is gonna play catch up, but they'll find that other countries have moved quite a bit in their four years of absence from this topic. Um, and you know, my advice just in the last few minutes, the, 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 the um, the absolute gem in the Paris Agreement is the ratcheting mechanism. Um, it's, and the ratcheting mechanism is that, you know, people sat around the table and said, we are making an agreement which we realize is insufficient. And we commit to each other that we will have greater commitments every five years. Um, and so I think my recommendation to the Kerry administration would be to champion the ratcheting mechanism at COP26 next year and say, not only are we coming back, we're actually going to make sure that everybody ratchets up their commitments from the Paris Agreement, because it's the ratcheting that will get us there. The Paris Agreement itself is, is way insufficient. It's fantastic that it's there. Uh, but the, the Kerry administration becoming the ratcheter in chief, I think, would be wonderful to see. <laughs> okay, and with that, I think we're going to uh, to close. I want to thank you very much for a terrific presentation. We really enjoyed this, and um, we hope to get you back again for your next book, uh, <laughs> yes. whenever that will be. Um, and uh, I would encourage everybody to go ahead and take a look at uh, Roland Cooper's new book. Uh, to our audience, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, you can check out the, uh, the final YouTube video on the link that's been provided in the chat. So thanks everyone. Uh, and we hope to see you uh, next semester when we uh, reconvene with this, uh, this seminar series again. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Scott.